Hello and welcome to another Back to Jerusalem podcast. I'm Eugene Bach, your host for this time, and I'm coming to you live on delay from somewhere within the borders of China. This is the final part of a four-part series. If you haven't listened to the other three sections of this series, I would highly advise that you go back into our archives and listen to those because those podcasts set the stage for what you're about to hear. This podcast and this series, I believe, is what makes us completely different than most Christian podcasts out there today. Though a lot of podcasts will, are, are, you know, Christian podcasts that are out there, many of them are for encouragement. Many of them are to talk about theological, philosophical items, sometimes social issues. This podcast is a little bit of a data dump where I share things that you may not hear in other places, but they can be verified. Like if you do a strategic search, you will be able to find information that will verify what I share on this podcast, but it's not really covered in a lot of podcasts. What makes us different is that, you know, to our discredit, we don't put a lot of effort into production. In fact, no effort. I have my mobile phone right now setting on a table in a cabin in the mountains of Northern Sweden. I don't have one of those sexy microphones that you often see in podcast videos, though I do have sexy microphone envy. I would like to have a really cool microphone to do my podcast because everybody else has one. I would also like to be maybe in an office with a bookshelf and in a, in a soundproof room that would allow for a great audio file for your listening experience as you're traveling down the road. But at Back to Jerusalem, I think that we care more about content than the packaging of delivery. <clears throat> That's why I'm coughing in this room that echoes. I do this podcast no matter where I'm at, traveling with this phone, to give direct field reports to our listeners, people that are praying for us, people that are supporting us, people that stand behind the Back to Jerusalem Chinese evangelists that are serving in some of the roughest areas, most unreached areas in the world. And in order to provide this kind of podcast, we put a lot of effort into the research and not so much into the packaging. And when we first started this podcast many years ago, there, there really weren't that many podcasts to compete. Now it seems like everybody has a podcast. And we are so thankful for our listeners who continue to come back over and over again because it's information like this four-part series that we feel is extremely important to get out there. This series was really started when I met in Ningbo with Pastor Amos. Pastor Amos, is, which is not his real name, um, is a pastor in the Underground House Church, but unlike most pastors or almost any pastors that I know in the Underground House Church, he's also a pastor with the Three Self-Government Church. And he sat down with me in Ningbo, not really Ningbo, but I, I use Ningbo as a place so that you can kind of place him a little bit. It's in Northeast China, but it's not the city of Ningbo, but I use Ningbo in order to help uh, his security. So I changed the name of the city and I changed his name in order to protect his security. And uh, when I met with him, he came into my hotel wearing a hat, dark sunglasses, and a mask to cover his face as he, you know, traversed all through the street cameras, which are everywhere in China. And he broke down China's five-year plan to infiltrate and change Christianity from inside. China has advertised this. So what I'm saying is not a conspiracy theory. China's advertised this. You can go onto our links. You can go to our website where we talk about this five-year plan and click on the actual government links that talk about the Chinification of Christianity or the Sinanization 
of Christianity, which means they have a goal in China to make Christianity more Chinese. But when you dig deeper into it, you find that actually they don't want to make it more Chinese at all. They want to make it communist. And so China has been working very hard to build a one world church or a one church of China, as they called it. And in this attempt to change Christianity, one of the things that they're doing is changing the Bible. This is something that has been a big part of what they've been focused on for quite a while. Changing the Bible, cranking out pastors and evangelists and, and ministers that graduate from the uh, Chinese theological seminaries, and to even create a, an exhibition or a museum, if you will, a Christian museum inside of China, where those three things alone are they're a part of their effort to change Christianity. So they're changing the Bible. One of the things that I shared in an early pod, earlier podcast was the story of the woman who was caught in adultery. We all know the story from the Bible where Jesus tells anybody that ha, is without sin to cast the first stone. And one by one, those that were accusing the woman of adultery leave. And then he asks the woman, where are your accusers? And she says, I have none. And he says, neither will I accuse you. Go and sin no more. And this is a story that illustrates the, the love, the grace, the mercy, the forgiveness of Jesus. But when you read the Chinese version, the Communist Party version, the reinterpretation of this story for the Chinese New Bible. This woman was stoned to death by Jesus. This is a part of the Chinification of Christianity to change the Bible so that it becomes more socialist or more socialist friendly. The second thing that they're doing quite rapidly is retraining pastors to focus on the Chinification of Christianity. So the pastors that are graduating from the universities today or from the seminaries in China today to be pastors for the official church in China have been hand-selected by the government, which means that the government members that select the pastors are Communist Party members, which means that they are, by definition, atheists. So atheists are choosing the pastors for the Christian church, not the church choosing the pastors. And then those pastors are being trained in the evils of Christianity and the evils of missionaries and why it's important to have the Chinese run the church in China, the three self church in China. The social discontent that was brought by wrong Christianity. The colonialism that was brought by Christian missionaries from abroad. The hardship that the people that followed these religions or Christianity, for instance, had to go through until they were rescued by the Communist Party. That is the history, the background, and the propaganda that is being pumped into the new pastors that are being sent out and to teach into the churches. And then finally, a museum or exhibition that has been set up in many different parts of China <clears throat> to allow Chinese to walk through the Christian heritage of their nation, starting in 1949, which is the Communist Revolution, the Cultural Revolution. The other thing that we are seeing is a focus on bringing in Western Christian leaders, organizations, churches, denominations that would be able to help China promote the good side of the scenification 
or Chinification of Christianity. To allow Western organizations to have access to China if they would agree to help promote their propaganda. Basically what we are seeing, and this is the final part of our series here, is a replacement theology. Where instead of Christ being the Savior, the Communist Party moves in to be the Savior. It is a counterfeit to the true worship of God. And this is not the first time that we see man trying to create a counterfeit to God's true worship. The Bible highlights one special instance about creating a counterfeit to the true worship of God. We see that in the book of John chapter 4, when Jesus approaches the woman of Samaria and says, Sir, I perceive that or the woman says to Jesus, she says, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain. But you say that Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. Now, there's often a different focus, and very rightly so, of the woman that's at the well. The Samaritan woman. But it's important to know that Samaria is in Israel where Jerusalem is in Judea after the split of the two kingdoms. The split of the two kingdoms came after the death of Solomon. So after Solomon died, there was some contention and debate on who would replace the king. There were two claims to the throne. One was a king that was accepted by ten of the tribes of Israel. And the other was a king that was only accepted by two tribes of Israel. And what we saw was a split in the geographical location of the nation of Israel. This woman at the well illuminated the fact that her Samaritan ancestors worshipped on the mountain where Jesus was. But because she acknowledged Jesus as a prophet, she knew that this was not the place of true worship. She knew that Jesus knew that this was not the place of true worship. She knew that Jesus knew that she was a Samaritan. She knew that Jesus knew that Jews were not supposed to communicate with Samaritans, associate with Samaritans, or have any dealings with them at all. When she saw Jesus as a practicing Jew, she already felt the guilt not just because of her lifestyle. You see, even before you talk about her lifestyle, she was guilty of being dirty in the eyes of the Jew just by being Samaritan. Now, there are some, there are some blood issues. When I say blood, what I'm talking about is the, the tribes of Israel. When you talk about Samaritans, there was, there was mixed marriages. And Samaritans being the offspring of those mixed marriages. And, and already from that, there were a lot of Jews that considered them unclean because they were not full-blood Jews. And because Jews often see Judaism as both a genealogical religion as well as a faith. So, for instance, uh, when we look at the story of Ruth, um, we see very clearly someone who was adopted into the family of the Jews that, was, that adopted the God of the Hebrews and therefore became one of them. And she told her mother-in-law, your people will become my people and your God will become my God. That was looked down upon during the days of Jesus, especially as the, the Jews tried to keep themselves ethnically clean from any outside influence. They were under the control of the, the, uh, Greek, the Romans, right? And while they were being occupied by the Roman territory, they tried to keep their bloodline clean. Samaritans were already dirty, at least by Jewish standards, because they had intermarriage in their people group. But it wasn't just that. The, the woman at the well said very clearly, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. 
our fathers worshiped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where the people ought to worship. John chapter 4, verses 19 and 20, and I read from the ESV. This is so imperative to understand what is taking place in China today. How does it relate? Watch this. The problem with Samaria arose after the death of King Solomon, right? So when King Solomon died, so King David was the one who brought in, ushered in the kingdom of Israel. He was the one who was able to conquer the Jebusites and set the city of God in Jerusalem, the city of David. So he was the one to finally bring about the full completion of God's kingdom when he ran out the Jebusites from Jerusalem. And this is where the temple of God was built under Solomon. So now we have King Solomon. And this is one of the most powerful kingdoms in the history of the Israeli people. And what takes place next is very unfortunate because when Solomon dies, one of his sons, Rehoboam, was set to become the next king. But Jeroboam, his other son, said, no, I'm the real king. And he led a revolt. And there were 10 tribes that signed on that Jeroboam was the true king of Israel. But Benjamin and Judah, the tribes of Benjamin and the tribes of Judah, said, no, Jeroboam is not our king after Solomon. Rehoboam is. Unfortunately, King Jeroboam and the ten tribes of Israel had the land to the north. And Jerusalem was there in the land of Judah and Benjamin. So once the two kingdoms split, Jerusalem ended up on the wrong side of the border for the kingdom of Israel. Now, if the people of Israel wanted to go for their feast that God told them to keep, to go and do the sacrifices at the temple that God told them to do, now King Jeroboam is going to have a problem. Because what king could allow his all of his his, his people, to leave his kingdom to go serve the one true God. And the one true God can only be worshipped in the land of the opposing king. Which would make many people think, if the one true God is in that land with that king, isn't that the true king? So what happened was, King Jeroboam, and the ten tribes of Israel set up an alternative temple. The alternative temple was counterfeit to the temple that God had instructed to be built. It was an alternative so that the people wouldn't have to leave Israel. They could go and do their sacrifices. They, built, they had their own priests. They had their own ceremonies. All of the feasts were celebrated not in Jerusalem, but in northern Israel. In many ways, this is exactly what China is doing. They realize that if we are, if we are the leaders of the Chinese people, but they worship and pray to another God instead of the Communist Party, we have competition. And the Chinese, given the choice, will choose God over the Communist Party. So we have to create a counterfeit, a place where the people can go to worship and we can tell them that it's okay. We can tell them that this is the one true worship. This is the place how you're supposed to worship God. This is the Bible you're supposed to read. I know that it's different than the rest of the, the Bible that has been in place for 2,000 years. But our Bible is the one you're supposed to read. I know that your leaders have been chosen by God in the past, but today they're chosen by the Communist Party. I know that you went to praise God in places that were set aside for worship, but now the Communist Party will dictate where you will go. It is Samaria. 
China has set up an alternative to Jerusalem. They've set up a counterpart, a counterfeit, to the one true worship of God. So in like manner, the government of China feels out of control when their people worship in places that they do not authorize. When they read a Bible that they do not authorize. When they acknowledge leadership that the Chinese government has deemed rebellious or evil or outlaws. So this whole five-year plan is China's desire to build Samaria. I hope that makes sense. I want to thank you so much for joining us for another Back to Jerusalem podcast. Again, I'm Eugene Bach, your host for this time, coming to you live on delay from somewhere within the borders of Sweden. God bless. God bless.